Welcome to the Real Python Podcast. This is episode 149. Have you explored Python's collection module? Within it, you'll find a powerful factory function called name tuple, which provides multiple enhancements over the standard tuple for writing clearer and cleaner code. This week on the show, Christopher Trudeau is here bringing another batch of PyCoders Weekly articles and projects. Christopher discusses his Real Python video course about writing more Pythonic code using name tuple. With name tuples, you can create immutable sequence types that allow you to access their values using descriptive field names and dot notation instead of clunky integer indices. We also discuss metaprogramming and the unique advantages of Python's dynamism. Christopher shares potential paths for this type of coding from web applications, testing, and AST techniques. We share several other articles and projects from the Python community, including a news update, the arrow revolution happening in Pandas 2.0, a new pep for inlined comprehensions, tips and techniques for modern Flask apps, a Python helper tool for building and running a REPL with custom commands, and a project to turn a Pandas data frame into a Tableau-style UI. This episode is brought to you by RevSys. RevSys is the leading Python consulting firm. They help organizations of all sizes build, scale, and improve their existing Python and Django-based web applications. All right, let's get started. The Real Python Podcast is a weekly conversation about using Python in the real world. My name is Christopher Bailey, your host. Each week, we feature interviews with experts in the community and discussions about the topics, articles, and courses found at realpython.com. After the podcast, join us and learn real-world Python skills with a community of experts at realpython.com. Hey, Christopher, welcome back. Hey there. So we got a couple news items you kind of grabbed here kind of quickly before we started. Yep. Uh, just a couple quick announcements. Uh, the first one is uh, the work on Python 3.12 continues and yeah. Alpha 6 has just shown up. So uh, lots of good stuff there. Uh, and in fact, they're still adding crap to it. Spoiler alert, we're going to talk about a new pep soon that's been slotted in there too. Okay. And then the second one, I haven't had a chance to look at this yet, but the results from the Django Developers Survey in 2022 uh, have been released. So uh, go look at the data. And uh, there were f almost 5,000 respondents from 240 some countries. So it uh, be interesting to see what the insights are there. Yeah, cool. It seems like JetBrains is always the the team that seems to help with these surveys. That's great. Yeah, they, it seems to be their uh, one of their go-tos. Yeah, awesome. So, and then you wanted to go first here with your first... Uh... If you if you insist, sure, why not? Yeah, okay, great. So I'm starting out this week uh, with one of my own courses. It's been a while since I've done the ego thing, so we'll uh, do it again. This one's called Writing Clean Pythonic Code with Named Tuples. And as with a lot of my projects, they're based on somebody else's work, so I don't have to do the heavy lifting. This one is Leo Donas Poso Ramos, of course. And as the title probably captures, it's all about named tuples. Named tuples are found in the collections module, and they're kind of halfway between a tuple and a class. They predate the data class concept, and so they serve kind of a similar purpose. Oftentimes when you're using a tuple, it's helpful if you have some more context. So if I give you a tuple with three numbers in it, for example, what does that mean? Uh, the name tuple adds that extra context. So I can create one specifying that it takes three arguments, the X, Y, and Z. Z, see, I'm bilingual. And the tuple itself is called 3D point, right? So that's a lot more meaningful than, say, just giving you something with three floats in it. You construct a named tuple using a factory function that is called named tuple, which, you know, all small case, nice and uh, simple idea. And you give the factory the name of the class that you want to create and the arguments it should take. It returns a class, and then you can instantiate that class as many times as you like. Uh, the argument block can either be a string with spaces in it, so that XYZ that I was talking about would be quote X space Y space Z, or it can be an iterable, so you can give it like a list of strings, each being X, Y, Z. I tend to use the latter simply because it seems 
it looks more like keyword args to me. It just makes more sense, but they both work. And like with classes, the name tuple arguments can take default values. So you can construct instances without all of the arguments. And once you've got your instance, you can now uh, use dot notation to access the members instead of just, say, square brackets like you would with in a tuple. This, to me, is one of the key advantages from a code readability point. So back to my 3D point example, in a normal tuple, I'd have to say point square bracket one. And whereas with my named tuple, I can say point dot y, right? And, and that's a lot clearer as to what that is. And uh, p- this is particularly useful if, you know, if the definition of the object is a fair ways away from the usage of it in your code, uh, where you can't, you know, you wouldn't see necessarily like a comment or something as to what is that second part. About half the course is dedicated to sort of use cases for the named tuple. First couple of lessons are on how to build them uh, and sort of where's and why's. A good example for code readability is using named tuples as return values from functions. So if you're writing a function that normally returns multiple things and you were going to use a regular tuple, it's not always clear what's inside of it. Yeah. And by returning a named tuple instead, your code is somewhat self-documenting. And again, a lot of these ideas predate the typing mechanism. So this is trying to deal with some of the same kinds of problems that typing now handles instead. So uh, the example in the course of this is uh, you get to rewrite the divmod function. Divmod does division returning both the quotient and the remainder. And the new version of it returns a named tuple called divmod. And inside of it, you can see that the quotient has one value and the remainder has the other. So it gives you the idea of what is actually coming back rather than just a tuple with two numbers in it. Course has a lesson on comparing name tuples to other data structures, including things like performance characteristics, as well as a lesson on extending the class to do your own funky stuff. So pretty much a classic Leodonis article and a course built on top of it, sort of taking something that everyone thinks is simple, oh, hey, I know what a name tuple is, and then going really deep on it and seeing all the stuff that you can do with it. So if you prefer the visual mode of reading, you got the article. And if you want me to yammer at you, you can take the course instead. Yeah, this is a good one. I I really enjoyed going through it and got a lot out of it. It's, you know, it's one of those things that I use a fair amount when I code and there was still things in there. I'm like, oh, hey, there's an idea I haven't tried before. I I should try that. So, yeah, there's always something in there, even if you've uh, if you've been around the block a couple of times. Cool. So my first one is an article by Mark Garcia, and it's on his own website, datapythonista.me. Mark is a core dev for the Pandas project, and his article is Pandas 2.0 in the Arrow Revolution, and then it is a part one. Not sure when part two will come along. This came out about mid-February at this point, and I wasn't aware of some of these changes, but I also wasn't aware that Pandas 2 was out. And it kind of is, and it kind of isn't. It's sort of in this sort of dev path uh, as like a bit of a release candidate, there aren't massive breaking changes and that's actually one of the beginning parts of it. And it's like, okay, how are we going to grow and adapt and move this ecosystem that pandas is the center of in many ways, how are we going to move that forward without breaking these changes for all the users? And so how can we do that and do more subtle, but really still more important things under the hood? One of the big things is this focus on arrow. And the Arrow library, I've mentioned, I don't know, probably for a year and a half now, off and on. And actually, I had a really good conversation when I was speaking about Polars a couple weeks back and how it uses that library also. It's not a data storage format. It's much more of an in-memory format and how the data structures are sort of held in memory. You can kind of think of it as like NumPy is really a you know, storage format, you're still organizing information. So there's things like Parquet that are potential things that go along with it. But what this thing did, this article for me, took me on this interesting journey through not only what Mark's been doing, but what Wes McKinney, who is one of the key guys who created Pandas from the beginning, Wes McKinney has been on a real journey trying to get this arrow format going and i had no idea how deeply involved he was with it and kind of why 
he had a presentation in 2013 at PyData New York. And at the, about the same time, he wrote an article about the 10 things I hate about pandas, which is very interesting, you know, coming from the creator of pandas. But he's always been that way, I guess. He always has wanted to think about the future, think about what the stumbling blocks are, and try to steer things toward where things are going. And he started to develop this Apache Arrow project in 2015, and since has continued to build a developer community around it and uh, sort of to achieve these dual goals of what it could do. And in 2017, he uh, had an article basically as a follow-up Apache Arrow and the 10 things I hate about pandas. And that kind of went a little further on it. And then there's a video that he, um, there's a organization called Two Sigma Investments. And he had a talk there at one of their conferences called Data Science Without Borders, which I'll include a link with, which I watched and really epitomized a lot of the this sort of like forward thinking and, and how he was working with uh, the creator and an kind of champion behind R and their teams. And he, he created this company called Ursa Labs, get it, pandas, bears, right? And in 2021, he described how he was working really hard with all these other platforms and organizations to make sure there's this compatibility Very often in data science, you're moving things kind of across different platforms, especially with like GPU accelerated stuff. There's this project called Rapids, CUDF, um, another project called Blazing SQL. And so he talks about a lot of these things. And in 2021, he has an article on his own blog called Joining Forces for an Aero Native Future. And at that time, they renamed the Ursa Labs to Voltron Data, which he felt was a, <laughs> a good name. And if you're not familiar with the cartoon Voltron of like all these robots coming together to create the big, large robot, which I think is, again, kind of a, a, a nice in-joke there. So why all of this stuff and why the need for it? I had a recent episode where I talked with Jody about uh, using NumPy, and we talked about kind of the structure of NumPy and how it's been used in pandas and this sort of primary method in it. But that's kind of the problem and solution for pandas up to now. But it wasn't really designed to be a data frame supporting library. And the problem with NumPy is it is really, you know, it's in its name. It's designed for numbers and integers and floats and things like that. And for other types, things like strings, dates and times, categorical data, you have to make a bunch of decisions about how that stuff's going to be handled. And this kind of goes back to the original article before I went on my big safari journey here and found all these other articles and stuff. He talks about that. He talks about initially the problem with Python data structures as themselves are really big. Something like an empty string is, I don't remember how many bytes it is, but just the fact that it's an object and it has all these methods and things that are attached to just an empty string in itself, uh, let alone things like lists, dictionaries, you know, tuples, and so forth. And so th- those data structures can be really slow because they have all that functionality built into them. And so NumPy help with that. But if you're not working with purely numbers, which has always been one of these things that has been what I've done as far as data science goes, has been like, words or addresses or other kinds of things of, of kind of working with other data that's in it, you have to do work and to kind of get it going. And so Arrow has a lot of types in it. It has, there, I'll include a link to this new documentation as far as uh, what's happening in Pandas. And it's really impressive the amount of formats that are now sort of D types that will be available. And the article that he goes through in Mark's article, he goes through and it describes a handful of different examples of how this code will look and be a little different. He also gets into the problems that have always been there for pandas as far as working with data that where there's nothing there, missing values that are in your data and 
what has been workarounds. And then it gets into, you know, the speed of operations and stuff like that. And a really great comparison chart of NumPy versus Arrow. And the other thing he likes to focus on in this is this sort of interoperability, the idea that there are different libraries that have, you know, advantages one way or the other. And they may be written in Python or C++, or they might be GPU-based, or they might be, you know, something like Rust, like what Polars is doing. And he talks about this example of like loading in the data from a a SAS platform into a pandas data frame and then exporting that data frame to a parquet file and then loading the parquet file from polars and then making transformations within polars because it's very quick. Exporting that polars data frame into a second parquet file and then loading the parquet into pandas and exporting the data. What he's saying is instead of having to do all that import export, if we can keep it all in memory, it's going to be dra- dramatically faster. And that's kind of what Arrow can provide is working with all of that and just transferring the information, you know, your data frames, if you will, in this in-memory format as Arrow. So I think it's a really nice article to get you going on a lot of these ideas. I, again, went on a big journey and was just fascinated to find out like how far and how long they've been working toward this thing. And I think it's important to pay attention to the space because it's, definitely the direction, no pun intended, that Pandas is headed. They're going toward Arrow and not only in Pandas 2.0, you know, you think about the direction of data science and what they're trying to do with it. And Wes has been working long and hard on it. I guess Mark would be also on the team there. They've all been working toward making this. And so that was really my main takeaway. Um, So I'll include lots of links on this. And I think you might get a lot of it just kind of seeing some of the decisions and why in the background behind Arrow. Yeah, it's truly one of Python's superpowers that you can just like plug in other stuff underneath it, right? And and being able to take advantage of, uh, you know, a solid library from something like the Apache Foundation and then build on top of that is, uh, you know, it, it allows us the best of both worlds, right? I, I don't yeah. have to code anything in C and, uh, and I can still take advantage of the speed, so. Yeah, totally. RevSys is a crew of Python experts. Their team of senior developers, ops people, and consultants knows what works and what doesn't. They've been where you are before, probably many times. Let them draw on their deep well of experience and guide you to smoother waters. RevSys offers a variety of services customized to your client's needs, like code reviews, architecture design, embedding with your team to improve velocity, writing your first tests, or doing your Python and Django upgrades for you. What you don't know can hurt you. Let us make suggestions to improve your code and processes. Learn more at revsys.com slash hello. So what's your next one? Well, uh, I think I kind of hinted at this earlier. The PEP thing, uh, so PEP 709, this one is called Inline Comprehensions, and it proposes a change to how uh, comprehensions get compiled in CPython. It's proposed by Carl Meyer, and it's sponsored by Guido himself, and that's got to carry some weight, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> so currently, when you use a list, a dictionary, or a set comprehension, a nested function gets compiled. What the PEP proposes is replacing this with inlined code instead. Benchmarks have shown that this can increase the speed of a comprehension by almost 2x, and that can cause speedups in the general benchmarks that use comprehensions. The couple that they ran, that was like a 10% improvement. So that's nice. What this really comes down to is how comprehensions turn into bytecode. At the moment, uh, when you have a comprehension, It gets replaced with a bytecode op called make function, which is the same as like a function that you're writing. And it has all the overhead of a function. So it needs to allocate and destroy a frame on the call stack. And instead of doing this, uh, what the pep proposes is just take the code that would be inside of that function and just stick it in line in the bytecode listing. So there's no outward, backward compatibility problems with this proposal at all. And the only place where it might get a little janky is if there's like an esoteric tool that relies on how the compiler is actually doing something. There's an underlying change to the behavior. But for those of us who are just using comprehensions in Python itself, you won't see anything but speed up. 
And they're already talking to a couple of the alternate Python interpreter folks like PyPy and Grawl. I think that's how you say that. I have found arguments on the internet about it, and it mostly seems to be all. Um, but I feel like it's a Monty Python reference and it should be Grail, but whatever. <laughs> what was I saying? Anyways, uh, so the non-C Python folks are already speaking up that they're willing to do the same thing. So we're going to even see this outside of the C Python world in all likelihood. The PEP was created on February 24th, and that's not that long ago. And it's already slotted for Python 3.12. Uh, like I said, getting sponsored by Guido uh, can make a bit of a difference. Yeah, seems like it. <laughs> One of the many, many performance improvements that are coming in 3.12, and this is yet another one of them. Nice. Yeah, 3.12 looks like it's going to be an exciting release. And we're not even at beta stage yet, so... <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. My next one is an article by Philip Jones. It's on his personal website, pgjones.dev. And it's titled 13 Tips and Techniques for Modern Flask Apps. We talk a lot about Django on here. I thought it'd be nice to kind of come back and look at some of the changes in Flask because I haven't talked about it a whole lot lately. What was interesting about the 13th birthday is one of the things that he wanted to celebrate here. It's upcoming. And that made me think about I had an interview with the creator of Flask, Armin Roenicker, uh, in episode 18, talking about the 10 years of Flask. And he kind of stepped away from the palettes, projects, and so forth. But there's actually a lot of sort of connections in there. It seems like Philip has done a handful of things there and kind of sharing these tips. I'm not going to hit all of them. I thought I could share just a handful of them. He talks a little bit about Generally, the platform has shifted from its initial designs and I think architecturally the way that web projects with Python have changed a lot uh, over that time. And this shift has been moving toward focusing on JSON style APIs versus like server rendered pages. I think it's a good resource to get you up to speed on some of these new techniques and styles in here. And I'm not going to dig too deep into them. Each one he has code examples with to kind of get you familiar with some of it. The first one that I want to share is shorthand method decorators. Flash pioneered this concise decorator approach for defining path handling. It's a, a nice style and, and kind of easy to, to read once you get familiar with it. The common thing for APIs in the syntax is to use uh, maybe just one HDB method per resource. So like at, you know, it uses a decorator style thing. So at app.post as opposed to at app.route and then having multiple methods attached to it. The second one he had was JSON return values. Flask has its own JSONify function to create JSON responses rather than an HTML response. So he shares some code examples there. Auto-generated open API documentation and writing RESTful APIs. Open APIs kind of is the standard for it. I'll include a link to the open API uh, standard so you can kind of be familiar with it. But you might have seen tools like Pydantic that's out there. And he shares a couple different options for generating open API style documentation with Flask. Uh, he shares one which is in the style of Pydantic, which is called SpecTree, and then another one that's been in some of our articles, which is called Marshmallow. And um, that one uses a, a tool called API Flask. He talks about Click using that, which is another palettes project. It's possible to extend the Flask CLI with your own custom commands. For example, creating a user with just saying flask create user bob and using click for that and he has real simple code kind of showing that click something that we've talked about in a bunch of our real python resources about clis and the last one is something that i wasn't familiar with but he talks about a, a thing called quart flask generally by itself is a WSGI framework wsgi um, meaning that it's not asynchronous and Quart is a tool that's sort of a re-implementation of Flask that uses async and await and therefore it is an ASCII ASGI and so Quart is something you can check into kind of playing on the the pun of Flask being an, an 
carrier of liquid and quart being a larger version of that. A note on here, I guess this is a palette sort of group sort of mention. Our aim is to merge flask and quart once we overcome some technical hurdles. But for now, they currently are maintaining both of them in the palettes projects. So if you haven't checked out the flask ecosystem lately, there's 13 tips to kind of get you going. And a few of them I wasn't familiar with, uh, quart being one of the main ones. Something to check out. Yeah, I, I really like there's uh, I hadn't come across before is the uh, the ability to uh, suck in a whole bunch of things from environment variables. Yeah. So there's a there's a call, a call to be able to take anything prefixed with flask out of the environment variables, which uh, depending on that's one of those things I think people fight over whether or not you should be using environment variables. But for certain kinds of container and cloud situations, it's often the best way to, to inject uh, configuration information. And uh, this th- that little tidbit uh, that I hadn't seen before can uh, make things a lot easier. This week, I want to shine a spotlight on another real Python video course. It's the course Christopher was discussing at the beginning of the episode this week. It's titled writing clean Pythonic code with name Tuple. It's based on a real Python tutorial by previous guest Leodonis Pozo Ramos. And in the course, Christopher Trudeau takes you through how to create name Tuple classes using the name Tuple factory function, how to identify and take advantage of the features of the name Tuple, such as helpful built-in string representation and ability to access named fields with dot notation while still providing immutability and similar memory consumption to regular tuples. You'll learn about how name tuple instances allow you to write more Pythonic code and decide whether to use name tuple or a similar data structure and how to extend the name tuple class to provide additional new features. As you'll learn in the course, you can use name tuple instances wherever you need a tuple-like object. Real Python video courses are broken into easily consumable sections. And where needed, include code examples for the techniques shown. All lessons have a transcript, including closed captions. Check out the video course. You can find a link in the show notes, or you can find it using the Enhanced Search tool on realpython.com. I think that takes us to a discussion this week. Yes. And you provided a couple different articles and then links to other people discussing them. And then then I found even more links beyond that. But yeah, do you want to introduce this one? Sure. Yep. We're going to discuss the discussion that discusses the discussion, which uh, (laughs) if if frequent listeners uh, may notice, we do this once in a while. So uh, yeah, it's becoming a regular thing. Yep. I, the, the the base uh, is really around an article by Luke Plant called Python's Disappointing Superpowers, and the disappointing is in quotes. Yeah. His post is meant as a response to another article by Hillel Wayne called I Am Dis- Disappointed by Dynamic Typing. Luke is very careful to say his article is a response, not a rebuttal. Yeah. Uh, it's nice to see some manners out there on the internet. It still exists once in a while. So I, really what the, the core of this is, uh, is Python has a bunch of dynamic uh, mechanisms in, inside of it. And there's a cost to all of us that we are paying all the time because of this. And so it's kind of a legitimate question of why are we paying this cost? And Luke's article champions the things you can do with dynamic programming and uh, all the things that would be hard or impossible in languages that don't behave this way. It's all kind of somewhat amusingly summarized by a flowchart graphic he's got in it, which uh, the top of it has the question, is this code a hacky monkey patch or is it a cool dynamic metaprogramming? And the answer basically is if I wrote it, it's cool and and dynamic, and if somebody else wrote it, it's a hacky monkey patch. Um, and <laughs> yeah. uh, so, what what he essentially does is he goes through and lists off a long list of I think there's like twenty items in here <laughs> of different cases of open source libraries that take advantage of some of this meta programming type stuff in Python. The first example that he gives is something called GUI, G-O-O-E-Y, uh, and it's a toolkit that dynamically reads the arg parse code in your command line program and creates a GUI, G-U-I, interface for you. 
So it's dynamically reading the Python and starting a new piece of software for you. And all those, you know, all that means that your Python, in order to do this, Python needs to be able to understand Python, right? The second example is, uh, which I like this one a lot. I've seen tools like it before. I haven't seen this specific one though, but the the second one is an it's an interactive debugger that sits on top of uh, WSGI based web frameworks, and what it does is it traps errors. So if you get a 500 error message in the web, normally you just get like the hey it blew up. This stops it, shows you the full stack, and then makes the stack clickable. And at any point in time in the stack, you can click on it and enter the REPL to see what's going on there. So this is a fantastic debugging tool. Because without things like this, you're always going back into your code and going, okay, well, I see where it blew up, but how did I get here? So there's a lot of examples from the sort of uh, web space. There's a whole bunch of stuff from Django and Pony ORM as well. And how they're dynamic relating objects and pushing all that into the database. So as I said, there's about 20 examples, plenty to sink your teeth into. Uh, His final point is that none of this is really magic because it's a language feature. And so hence the quote to the beginning, nothing here is actually a superpower. This is just Python. You know, if the article itself isn't enough, it's been making its rounds. So uh, there's a Hacker News listing, a meta discussion about the meta discussion. Uh, Unfortunately, being the internet, it kind of boils down to, I like static typing and you are dumb. Uh, But (laughs) you you can skip through those parts. Uh, But uh, it's, uh, I'm exaggerating a little bit. Hacker News is relatively respectful environment, but you get the idea. So what do you think of the uh, examples? And did anything stand out to you in the, and then the discussion itself. So I ended up with some questions and I think this is something that has been, I don't know, I I hit these blocks very often where I'm reading something, especially like a discussion, and my eyes sort of glaze over. I'm like, Mm -hmm. okay, they're just using a bunch of words that I'm like, I don't feel like I have the grasp upon. Yep. And I'm going to have to go look up some stuff. Um, and sometimes I enjoy doing that, yep. you know, and other times I hate doing it. <laughs> and, and oftentimes they're using the words slightly differently because of the bias of the language they come from, right. which just makes it a messy conversation. Yeah. So I think we could start with just the idea of the dynamism of Python versus, you know, static. And the most common place that has been discussed, not as much this year, but last year it was like almost ad nauseum, we were just talking about type checking <laughs> and all, this parade of these peps coming into Python and, and adding more and more and more and more type checking, which is and still has always been an optional thing. In fact, if you're brand new to Python, it's rare that anybody even throws this in your face as you're learning Python about types versus other languages. That's you know, literally the first things you need to learn. You know, the the idea in Python that things can be dynamic, that this first variable that you create, you can, you know, assign it with an equal sign to be an integer just by putting a number in there, right? But later in their program, you can have this dynamism of like, well, I've decided that that, that age shouldn't just be an integer. It should actually be something that's going to be printed out and I need it to actually be uh, a string instead. And you can do that. And that's really kind of interesting and you don't have to spend a whole lot of time discussing it. It's just something that sort of works as you're learning Python. And so I kind of get that dynamic typeness of it, but it is the entire language, right? And so there's these interesting things that you can kind of do with it, that you can kind of change lots of stuff behind the scenes modify things and in the language is dynamic in other ways that are kind of cool like the way that jupyter notebooks kind of work and the idea that you can be trying out experiments again and 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 doing lots of different things that are again very dynamic as you're creating it and that allows this sort of playfulness and this ease of learning in some ways which i think is really nice and is an advantage to it. But then there's this whole other side of it that kind of starts to move into this idea of the term that's often thrown out there is metaprogramming. And again, that's that's like a stopper for me. It's like, okay, well, 
okay, if I just like look at the words and I go meta, <laughs> it's programming about programming or is it programming that makes programs, which I think is kind of what I think, you know, the core meaning of the words there. And so I guess, I don't know if you want to just sort of like define what you feel meta programming is. Uh, yeah. And, and I'm sure there's like probably a CS definition of it, uh, but I think it's one of those terms that kind of gets used a little bit loosely. Yeah. And, and part of that is because unless your operating system is going to stop you from doing what I'm about to say, most all programs can write a program and execute it, right? So like even if you're writing assembly or C, that program could, as its output, generate a program and then call exec on it. So it's, the nature of computing is the data and the code have this mushy sort of relationship. Yeah. But some some programming languages provide features that make that a lot easier to do. On the extreme end of that is something like Lisp, where the actual structure and memory of the code is the same structure as data, and uh, it uses something kind of like tuples in uh, Python. And as a result, you can go and change all of that. Python's not quite as far along that line as Lisp. And in fact, uh, the article that this was in response to has a term in it that I hadn't come across before. Uh, home, and I'm not sure I'm going to be saying this properly, but it's homeo... Oh, let's try this again. <laughs> Homo-iconicity. Wow. And that's that nature of uh, the, the code and the data kind of being the same thing. And Lisp is very much like that. So because Python allows you to do some things like the AST module allows you to read Python in and manipulate it, that's kind of leaning a little towards that. Because everything in Python is an object, and objects are built on something called a meta class, which is part of the typing system that underlines everything, you can generate new classes on the fly programmatically. And a lot of the examples that uh, are in Luke's article are sort of heading down this path. And this is where it gets kind of messy in some of the conversation. Like it, when you dig into the Hacker News conversation, some people are going, when they start talking about dynamic, they're they're starting to talk about really what you were talking about, which is the typing thing, right? I'm going to change the yeah, answer right. to a string. And other people were talking about, you know, uh, let's build something, right? So right. I can give you an example from uh, some code I've written for myself. Django has a tool in it, a web-based tool that allows you to sort of manipulate the database. So any object that you're creating, they're called models. Any model that you create, you can quickly define a little class and you automatically get this web interface for filling it in. So, if, you know, the, your standard example is like a person with a first name and a last name. And so you've got those fields. I can just quickly create an admin class. I essentially just say point it at the model and it automatically generates a web page for me. Well, there's a whole bunch of things you can do to the admin class, but because it inherits from a class, it's kind of, it becomes very boilerplate. So I wrote some code that is a, a meta generator of that class. So you call a function and it returns back a dynamically generated inheritor of the admin class and allows you to set up a whole bunch of properties in like a single line. And it means you don't have to write what would be 10 or 20 lines of boilerplate over and over again inside of the admin class. So this is the kind of dynamicity, I'm making words up now, That's okay. that, that Luke's kind of talking about in the article. And, and that to me is, that's at least where my head wraps around when somebody says, you know, what is meta? That, that's the kind of thing that I think we're sort of talking about. And there's a lesser version of, of that as well. A lot of languages will have the ability to do inspection. So you might not be able to generate, but you can examine things. So Java's got something in it called reflection, and it allows you to sort of look at the code that's running and determine a bunch of things about it. And, and again, that's kind of leaning in this direction. But Python takes it, uh, makes it easy to take it further. I think, you, like I said, you can almost do it in just about any language. But Python's built uh, so that you can do a lot of this stuff. And, and that's, you know, as I'm reading through it, the the advantage of this and some of the stuff that's kind of neat about it is you had a problem and you wanted to solve it. And that's one of the kind of cool things about Python is that, and definitely one of the things that it leans toward is that it has flexibility in that sense and it's a good tool for people that you know want to solve these types of problems the thing that happens though is 
that may be funky again going back yeah. to the uh you know hacky monkey patch or whatever it's like okay well but i did solve my problem yeah well and <laughs> and, and luke kind of mentions it in the article the uh, the vast majority of the cases that he brings up are developer centric tools right and i think most of the time that i've done monkey patching it's been either so one of the more common places to use it is uh, like in tests, right? So I, I'm writing some code that is it right. goes and checks the current date time. Well, if I'm testing that, that's problematic because I don't know what the answer is going to be when the test is run. Right. So I patch the code dynamically to say, hey, date time, always return this date time. And Python makes it easy to do that kind of stuff. There have been a couple places where you know, I've got some code and I'm working with somebody's library and either in the test environment or the development environment, I want it to behave subtly differently. If someone gave me a compiled DLL in another language, I'm probably stuck. In Python, I can go, oh, look for this function. <laughs> and instead of when it's called, instead of calling it, call mine instead. And, and all I have to do is write the replacement function and their code continues to work. So it lets you do some borderline nefarious things with other people's libraries, which can be really, really powerful when you're uh, when you're coding and debugging stuff. And I think that's where... And I think this is also one of the reasons why you don't see it as often get touted, because it really is an advanced topic. And it's an advanced topic that tends to get used a lot on internal tools. And so as a result, it, it's kind of the guru-y type people who are sitting up the mountains. And when it's done well, like in something like uh, Django or Pony, it's been wrapped for you and you don't have to understand what it's doing underneath the cover. So you just get to take advantage of it and you don't have to go, oh, wait a second, how is it doing that? Right. And and it's definitely something that, like you said, it comes out of that world. They do that a lot in the ORMs and, and things where you're, you know, needing to, you know, sort of map one thing to another thing or in the testing environment where you're like, well, I need to be able to have something behave in a specific way or using the abstract syntax tree to, again, debug and see how things are behaving and and pull things out of it almost in like a live way. So it's a lot of interesting stuff. And kind of to talk about the advanced thing, there's this quote that I think got brought up in at least one of the different articles we were looking at by Tim Peters, and it's meta classes are deeper magic than 99% of users should ever worry about. If you wonder whether you need them, well, you don't. The people who actually need them know with certainty that they need them and don't need an explanation about why. And so that's kind of the stuff that happens sometimes is that a beginner or intermediate person sees these things flying around uh, in the you know text that's around them and and says, there's no one definitively saying, you know, hey, yeah, you don't need to worry about that. Occasionally, there's that part of a intermediate person that says, yeah, but I want to know it, you know, or yeah, I want to play with it because that's what the cool kids are doing or whatever. Well, um, and then gets themselves into some <laughs> deep water. <laughs> yeah, no, and I find when I use it myself, it's one of those things that, I understand what's out there. I know what it's able to do, but I use it so seldomly that I almost always have to refresh myself before I go and play with it, right? Like I, uh, so there, there's comprehension and then there's comprehension, right? Like it's it's something, you know, I, I, I might use once a year or two. And so I'm always sort of having to remind myself, I'm like, okay, I know I can go off and do this and I know it's a type and I know I had to, okay, I can use the meta class and all right, now how do I do all that again? And yeah. often I just go back and look at my own code. But, uh, you know, we've talked in the last few episodes about a couple different projects that take advantage of some of these things and they're and they're funny little uh, you know nonsense examples but uh, one was to create a C style for loop yeah yeah very much taking advantage of a lot of this kind of stuff he's dynamically using the AST uh, module to reparse his own code while the code is running there's another one out there. I'm not sure we talked about much, but there's another one out there where someone has had the audacity to put brace brackets inside of Python. And uh, in any other language, you'd be having to write a new language. Uh, you know, that's like a superset of the language. Uh, he's figured out how to do it dynamically. Right. We talked a while back about 
the infinite array, which uh, every time you access something in the array, it goes off and calls uh, GPT and, and and guesses what the next item in the array should be, right? And, and and the reason that works is because you've got these hooks, right? And there's some degrees of it, right? So some of it is as simple as like all comparison operators are implemented as dunder methods, right? So if you want your object to behave with and, you right. can, with add, excuse me, you can. And I don't know if I would quite call that metaprogramming, but that's that's dipping your toe in, right? Like that's that's the idea of I, I can start doing things in the language that are uh, feel to me like they would be part of the language, and it turns out no, everything's an object, and you can do whatever you sweet like. Yeah, the the customizing of the the special sort of dunder methods is a a nice sort of gateway into it in some ways. Is like if you would like it to behave this way you know, like comparison operator wise or addition or subtraction. It's it, and definitely an interesting place to kind of like look at it. And again, often I had heard them referred to initially as magic. And it's like, well, it's not really magical, you know, as much as like, you know, a mechanic working on your car maybe seems magical sometimes, you know, because you don't know how to do it. Uh, we're our own worst worst enemies, right? Like uh, right. calling something magic is just going to frighten somebody off right. for when they want to go off and do it, right? So, yeah, it's... it's uh, I, I you know I, your car analogy is kind of an interesting one, right? So the the, the core parts of the programming language are kind of like a car from the nineteen fifties, right? Like right. everybody's dad knew how to do the basic maintenance, and as long as you're in that space, you're okay. You know, I can swap out the spark plugs or do whatever. Uh, versus say a modern car, which has got all the computer stuff in it, and uh, you know, forget it. You have to take it to a right. mechanic who has to plug it into a into the wall to find out what's wrong, right? And yeah, my headlights I, steer themselves now. Exactly, right? So, so <laughs> I, you know, there are, and where my analogy falls down is, uh, you know, unlike that example, you can actually just treat your car as if it's the 1950s thing you can you can just ignore the computer on the side and play with the parts you understand right um and, but when you get to it if you find a need there's you know that computer module sitting in the corner uh, hiding underneath the spark plugs yeah there's some other terms that got used like hyper programming is another one that got thrown out there that seems to be just like another level on top of the idea of programs being the data but i don't know it's it's interesting you had linked initially to Hacker News thread, and then I found like some lobsters threads. I guess these were maybe at the bottom of Luke's article. And the first one on on one of them was funny, was an, an answer right back from from Hello. Was that his name? What was his name? Hello, Wayne. Yeah, yeah. And he his first comment back was I feel like a Machiavellian puppet master who tricked everybody into showing me cool <laughs> hyperprogramming stuff. <laughs> I was like, that's pretty good. So, yeah, I mean, he got what he wanted. He got people to kind of talk about it a little bit more, and people were down to talk about it. You're right that, you know, a handful of people got caught up in in that first level of like, the types are good. You know, it's like, sure, okay, that's not exactly what we're saying, (laughs) you know. Yeah, it's almost like going beyond that to the dynamism that is underneath everything. So that takes us into projects this week. What was your project? I'm playing with a project called REPL Builder, and it's by Rocky Lee. And Rocky explicitly calls out that he uses Vim on his profile, and that's not why I picked the project, but good for you, Rocky. <laughs> High five. Uh, <laughs> m- m- makes an old man, you know, f- f- feel all warm and fuzzy. So if you've ever used uh, arg parse to build a command line interface with subcommands, uh, this is kind of like that, but in interactive mode. So if you're new to this idea, a subcommand is something like what git uses, where you say git commit or git add, the commit and add are the subcommands. And in arg parse, you can do the same thing by creating subparsers. The REPL builder instead helps you create an interactive session, like a REPL, where you can give those subcommands inside of the session. So the example in the project is a calculator, and he defines an add, a subtract, a multiply, and a factorial command. And uh, very similar to arg parse, like it's a one-liner that you essentially create the command and then you call a runner and uh, very similar to defining them as arg parse things. And each command is written as a class and it actually is built on top of arg parse. 
So in the REPL, everything's text. But if you want to turn, say, for add, you're adding two numbers, two and three. Well, you're, you, you need to pass the parsing mechanism a parser. And that parser is an arg parse parser. And you just say, hey, this is just like a command line argument. I'm expecting two arguments and they're going to be numbers. And arg parse converts it all for you. So this works really, really cleanly. So it's a handy little addition to any project that already uses subcommands. And if you're doing subcommands with arg parse, uh, like it, four or five lines of code will get you going with this. And then you'd have both arg parse and interactive. So uh, it'd be worth checking out, something to play with. I like the, the renaming of calculator. <laughs> yes. I, yeah. Uh, he, he's, he's got a few interesting little puns in the example. But Yeah, yeah. So my project, it's kind of a fun visualizer tool. I talked about a project couple weeks ago about working with sort of a drag and drop interface that mirrored the types of things you would do in Excel in some ways kind of went beyond that and would provide that in say a Jupyter notebook. This one's doing kind of a similar thing with data visualizations. It's uh, spelled P Y G Walker and it's based on a project called graphic Walker Though, since it's PYG, they have a fun way of just pronouncing it Pigwalker. And the project is by Canaries uh, with a capital K instead of a C. I'll include a link to their site, but they have a handful of different tools. They're the ones who actually create the graphic walker. And so kind of all in the family there. If you've ever used very common office tool uh, for people doing data visualizations and sort of data analyst stuff, which is a tool called Tableau, which is a very drag and drop kind of interface. This mirrors that and then provides an open source sort of alternative to that. And you just give it a data frame and then it gives you the values that it's found inside of it and you drag them into different boxes that are available for you to adjust things. You can say, what's the X axis? What's the Y axis? Would you like to filter by? What could do the scaling of colors or opacity, size of things, shapes of things? And so if you are wanting to learn a little more about creating visualizations, I think this is a good place to experiment a little quicker than writing out code each time to do these things by just simply dragging and dropping and playing around in it. Pretty impressive demo of a tool um, and open source. And they provide a Kaggle site for you to play with, a Google Colab site for it, and um, Graphic Walker's own online demo. And it integrates really nicely with Jupyter, like many of these data science tools today. So again, kind of making an introduction to data science and creating visualizations a little easier. I was uh, impressed with Canary's projects here. I think that brings us to the end of an episode here. Thanks for bringing all these projects and articles this week, Chris. Always a pleasure. Good to be here. All right. Talk to you soon. Cheers. Remember, every developer needs to lean on a more experienced team member from time to time. RevSys and their team of Python experts at RevSys.com can be that team member for you. I want to thank Christopher Trudeau for coming on the show again this week. And I want to thank you for listening to the Real Python podcast. Make sure that you click that follow button in your podcast player. And if you see a subscribe button somewhere, remember that the Real Python podcast is free. If you like the show, please leave us a review. You can find show notes with links to all the topics we spoke about inside your podcast player or at realpython.com slash podcast. And while you're there, you can leave us a question or a topic idea. I've been your host, Christopher Bailey, and I look forward to talking to you soon.